Let There Be Light is a movie directed by and starring Kevin Sorbo, co-starring Kevin Sorbo's wife, Kevin Sorbo's children, and featuring Kevin Sorbo's far-right Christian conservative worldview, made manifest in a series of hollow arguments and logical fallacies. Sorbo plays Dr. Saul Harkins, an author who the film calls the world's most famous atheist. A vague reference to Dr. Richard Dawkins, but also a straw man for atheism in general. In the beginning of the film, he debates a creationist and has the university student audience in the palm of his hand. He takes almost sexual pleasure in humiliating the creationist with his brand of acerbic wit and loud, bombastic arguments. Harkins wins the debate not so much because he disproved God, but because his argument was more appealing to the audience. He tells his audience what they want to hear. For the socially conservative Christian demographic of this film, this scene is confirmation of what they suspect about atheism. It is appealing to young people because it lacks responsibility. The real truth is under attack by liberal authors and professors. Let There Be Light is a didactic film, but it is proselytizing rather than genuinely informing. The film does not shy away from this, it explicitly says so. There is a lot to cover with how much Let There Be Light gets wrong, but maybe the best place to start is how it propagates popular myths about atheism. When spiritual matters come up on my show, it is never my intention to convince viewers of something so grandiose, like that there is or is not a god. That's not my job. I try to approach a spiritual matter in a film with the same reverence that the author gives it, or its intended audience would give it. I make exceptions to this, like with indefensible beliefs, like prosperity gospel or premillennial dispensationalism. So bear in mind, when I deconstruct this film's fallacious arguments about atheism, I am not trying to promote atheism or attack theism so much as I am trying to explain why many common theistic arguments against atheists are not logically defensible. It's a distinction I trust my audience is reasonable enough to see. Let's begin. The first thing we learn about Dr. Saul Harkins is that he's a jackass. He is condescending to his debate adversary. He advocates a life creed that is essentially party on. Oh, you want to know what my religious credo is? Party on, Wayne! He drinks while he drives. He is not a very present father. He surrounds himself with ne'er-do-wells. He is prideful and obsessed with himself and so on. Many theists believe that there is no such thing as a good atheist. After all, how could anyone have morality without God? This question is asked by theists who believe that our sense of morality comes from God or is dictated by God. For theists, this is perfectly fine to live life in that belief, but upon trying to convince atheists that they are inherently immoral due to their lack of belief in God, we come across a circular argument, a logical fallacy. A circular argument restates the argument rather than attempting to prove it. For example, in the statement, Dr. Harkins is a good communicator because he speaks so well, we get a circular argument. The conclusion that Harkins is a good communicator and the evidence used to prove it, he speaks so well, are essentially the same idea. Specific evidence such as his ability to use comedy to reach his audience, his use of uncomplicated language to neatly break down complex problems, or illustrating his points with personal, meaningful stories would all be evidence to prove the hypothesis that Harkins is a good communicator. In the case of theists proving that atheism is inherently immoral, we run into a similar circular argument. Some variant of, atheism is immoral because belief in God is moral, but the second part of that statement only restates the first part. It does not provide evidence for why atheism is immoral, or why belief in God is moral. Theists could attempt to argue that atheists are immoral by providing anecdotal evidence, a bad encounter with an atheist like Harkins, for example. If someone bumped into Harkins at a party and had an uncomfortable moment with the world's most famous atheist, one could make the leap that atheists in general behave this way. He's a jerk, he's insensitive, irresponsible, and a sloppy drunk. However, a personal experience, an isolated incident, or a collection of a small sample size of data does not constitute compelling evidence. 
A singular witness to, say, a singular crime could be credible enough evidence that the crime was committed, but broad declarative statements about an entire worldview or group of people requires more than one's personal experiences. Another logical fallacy related to proving atheism is immoral is begging the question. This is similar to a circular argument. The person trying to prove something assumes the truth of what they are trying to prove. The conclusion is stated by the premise. If one needs to initially believe the premise in order to believe the conclusion, then one has not established anything. One cannot establish something by assuming it. Theists use their holy texts as evidence that belief in God is moral and non-belief is immoral, but this relies on the belief that said texts are true in the first place, and that's where begging the question comes in. Everything in the Bible is true. It says so in the Bible. You will only find this argument convincing if you already believe the Bible is true, which is both the premise and the conclusion. Again, I am not interested in proving or disproving the divinity of the Bible or someone's personal faith, but this argument is not enough. There is no real data that proves not believing is immoral, because suggesting otherwise is predicated on something that has not been proven. Dr. Harkins is a jackass, but that is because Let There Be Light wants to portray him that way. It reinforces what the target audience of the film already believes about atheists. Okay, back to the narrative of the film. We learn that Dr. Harkins' books are given sensationalist titles like Aborting God, which is just one example of the film's sense of subtlety. Dr. Harkins exclaims that he knows that there is no God because Harkins' son tragically died. Since then, Harkins has devoted his life to proving God does not exist through a series of popular books. The son's death must be fairly recent, the past few years or so, making one wonder what Harkins was doing with his life prior to this. He is some sort of overnight atheist sensation. He parties and gets drunk with his two business partners, one of whom is coded gay. The character mentions an interest in women, but that is not what coded means here. He is given effeminate qualities, an over-the-top affectation, and becomes the straw man for what socially conservatives believe is the limp-wristed liberal movement. Although not explicitly called gay, so that the film can avoid direct accusations of homophobia, the film delivers a coded homophobic message to the film's demographic. So let's not be naive about media literacy and what the film is trying to convey. Dr. Harkins is miserable and still grieving the loss of his son, which brings us to the next myth about atheism. Dr. Harkins became an atheist because of the tragic loss of his son. This is a trope that surpasses the borders of this film. The once faithful man, often someone of the clergy, who has lost his faith and must regain it, is a common, perhaps overused character in a film. Someone befalls a tragedy or has seen too much horror in the world, but then receives supernatural evidence to the contrary, and his faith is restored. In reality, faith has not been restored. Evidence has been presented. What these films and Let There Be Light get wrong about faith is that it is not lost due to a tragedy. It can, perhaps, but the implication of virtually every film, including this one, is that a lack of faith is a failing that must be overcome and that a loss of faith must have had something negative that preceded it. This is not actually true. The other thing movies like this get wrong about faith is how it is recovered. The word faith in the spiritual context should not be mistaken for certainty. Faith in the spiritual context of the word means strong belief based on spiritual apprehension rather than proof. Certainty means unassailable proof exists. In other words, if you are certain, then one would not require faith. Dr. Harkins lost his faith in God, but he does not receive a moment of enlightenment. He receives proof. He has a near-death experience in which he sees his dead son. Certainty and faith, under the spiritual definition, are mutually exclusive. The nature of faith requires less than certainty. Anyway, the real answer to why some people are atheists is far less sensational. On some occasions they are simply raised without a religion, and atheism comes about naturally. For others it's different but just as simple. 
People have the opportunity to adopt a new outlook when confronted with alternative viewpoints, experiences, and education different from that with which they were raised. Based on Pew research on the matter, showing rising secularism and atheism specifically upon someone reaching higher levels of university education, the implication is that the introduction of alternatives allows for differing viewpoints, including theological. I want to be clear, that does not necessarily mean college equals atheism, of course. It only means that leaving home and no longer following the guidelines of one's parents provides opportunities for new ways of viewing the world. The increase in secularism in the 21st century may have something to do with information being more readily available due to the internet. Again, this does not mean that knowledge equals atheism either, or that ignorance equals theism, obviously. It only means knowledge equals confronting previously held beliefs. Some people keep their childhood religion, and some people change their religion from one theistic faith to another theistic faith, and some people adopt agnosticism or atheism. I've made dozens of videos explaining what Christians and other theists believe. I may as well briefly explain what atheists believe. Atheists think there probably is no God because extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Atheists would say that the counterargument of you can't prove God does not exist is another logical fallacy called appealing to ignorance. Because complete proof that something is false is usually impossible, a lack of proof against something is not a good reason to conclude that it's true. If you've ever heard someone say, you can't prove a negative, that's basically what this means. A claim puts the burden of proof on those making the claim, not on the person disbelieving it due to lack of evidence. In a nutshell, that is what atheists believe, and frankly it's not as fascinating or sensational as movies like Let There Be Light make it out to be. In the film, Dr. Harkins not only became an atheist due to tragedy, he also exhibits a related trait that is also a myth related to atheism. That he hates God. He seems vindictive. He says, even while extolling atheism, that God took his son. Here's the thing. Atheists cannot hate God because atheists do not believe God exists. Being an atheist, by definition, is not believing in God. If someone believes in God, they cannot call themselves an atheist. If someone hates God, it is predicated on first believing God exists. So an atheist cannot hate God. This is not some no true Scotsman situation. I know that's a logical fallacy too. I'm not saying, oh, a real atheist wouldn't do the bad thing or anything like that. I'm saying if someone hates God, then the term atheist is not applicable or appropriate or correct. It's another word and another definition altogether. Claiming an atheist hates God is a contradiction in terms. Some people hate God, but by definition they cannot be atheists. They are usually called maltheists or anti-theists. And there are some faiths that do portray God as inherently malevolent. So yes, some people in the world do hate God, but atheists can't by very definition of who they are. In the film, Dr. Harkins follows this trope. He suffered a tragedy, he experiences the supernatural, and he becomes religious once again. A near-death experience allows him to see his departed son. Harkins apologizes to his family for his previous atheism kind of the way someone apologizes for being in a bad mood one day because they were hangry or something. It's embarrassing. The whole movie is embarrassing, though. Let There Be Light strays from its central claim, atheists are just bad, to dip its toes into other socially conservative talking points. Yeah, this is going to get more uncomfortable, sorry. Every reference to Islam in the film is to Al-Qaeda, ISIS, or a singular formerly Muslim woman who converted to Christianity after escaping Islam. Let's be clear here and not be naive. The reduction of Islam purely into ISIS is entirely intentional. 
To a movie like Let There Be Light, the only good Muslim is one who converts to Christianity by the end of the film, and all others cannot be trusted. The opening credits even invokes 9-11 and Al-Qaeda. Dr. Harkins wants to set up a Christian phone app to give selfies to God, yes really, and convert everyone to Christianity. So he goes on Fox News with Sean Hannity, and this exchange happens. What right do you have to impose your religious values onto somebody else? Well, what right does ISIS have to cut people's heads off? That's a powerful point. Is it? Is it Hannity? Because that's actually two logical fallacies in one. The first is the either-or fallacy, in which a conclusion oversimplifies an argument by reducing it to two sides or choices, sometimes irrelevant choices like in this case. The second is that this argument, well what about ISIS, is a diversionary tactic, or red herring, or whataboutism, a method of avoiding an issue by focusing the audience's attention on something else entirely, or something allegedly worse. Dr. Harkins and Sean Hannity are using their fair and balanced news program to convert people to Christianity. The loyal adherents of Fox News have virtually no chance of joining ISIS. They are inventing a potential consequence to do something that has nothing to do with the actions of ISIS. There are so many ISIS references in this movie, and nearly all of them are non sequiturs. Let me ask you something. Is the God you believe in any different than the God of ISIS? Because they certainly don't think so. They're no less sincere in their beliefs than you are in yours. This whole ISIS is no different than the church thing has gone viral, baby. Look what those guys ISIS, look what they're wearing. Their clothes are black, their flags are black. They're a cult of death. And unlike ISIS, this is not a convert or die proposition. Listen to this. What if we do a t-shirt that says ISIS equals church? We should be proselytizing life with as much vigor as ISIS proselytizes death. But millions of points of light have lit up the darkness around the world in Iran and ISIS occupied territories. Well, what right does ISIS have to cut people's heads off? ISIS does not actually show up in Let There Be Light. This is not an action movie or a war movie. It just keeps mentioning ISIS as if the only alternative to Christianity is to become an Islamic militant. I could go on. There is this enthusiastic plug for Chick-fil-A, the anti-gay fast food chain, but it's not product placement. Chick-fil-A is not seen in the film. Harkin's wife just casually mentions that her children only want to eat at Chick-fil-A. No money to that godless In-N-Out burger. Kevin Sorbo just really, really wanted to sprinkle in as much anti-gay and socially conservative references into his film. Hannity says the word diversity like he is spitting out poison. And there's more I could talk about, but this has gone on far too long as it is. I hope this has been educational. And I hope, more than anything, that people don't assume the worst about people based on what they check on the religion question on the census. People believe the things they believe for a variety of reasons, most of them innocuous. The vast majority of atheists are just regular guys, and the vast majority of Christians would probably hate this awful, cynical, ignorant movie. Hi everyone, if you like what I do, please click on the orange Patreon link below. That's how this show happens. It's also the only way to request an episode. Also, please like, share, subscribe, and click on the notification bell so that you never miss an episode. I'll see you next week.